Hello and welcome to Reef Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Ozzy. And we've just been to see The Worst Person in the World in Norwegian Verdens Verste Menesker. And I'm sure I'm getting so. <laughs> the pronunciations wrong. It's um, written and directed by Joachim Trier, mm. written with Eskil Vogt. And it's his third film in the Oslo trilogy, which started with Reprise in 2006 and then Oslo 31st of August in 2011. Uh, I've seen neither of those. I, I I think I may know the guy's name, but I've not seen any of his films before. Yes, I mean I feel the same way. I, I kind of I wonder if I've seen mm. uh, at, at least the first one. Um, but actually, having seen this, I think if I had seen it, I would remember it because uh, I like this film very much. What did you think? Um, I I, um, I liked it, but I I feel like it's being overpraised, and I'm not sure. I I think people are getting attached to it in a way that I feel like I didn't. Ah. Um, so, I mean, so I, I didn't know anything about it. The title suggested I th- it might be very funny, and it is funny, but not in the way I thought. I thought it would be like about well, the worst person in the world, someone who someone who does bad things and that kind of thing. It's not. It's about it's a kind of millennial um, angst movie about this girl who's nearing thirty. In the film, we see her reach thirty, and this, there are all these questions around what she's going to do with her life. And right at the start, it's she, she's going to be a doctor, and then she changes and then uh, to psychology. Um, well, that's kind of doctor. She's going to be a surgeon, then she changes to psychology, and then she changes to photography. Uh, photography, and you know, just kind of on a whim. And her parents, her mum, is quite supportive. It's like, okay, you know, what you get, what, do what you want to do, and all this. I support you. I love you. Um, and it's played for laughs, right? You know, so it is a comedy. It's definitely a comedy. Um, and then we see her getting to a relationship with someone who's probably fifteen years her senior, and the question is, it going to work, and so on. And as the film goes on, it's about. It's about what life is like and what the relationships are like and how we decide to live and questions around what are we going to do with our lives and so on and so forth. Um, like I feel like it's totally aimed at someone like me. I'm her age, basically. What are you going to do? Um, you know, are you going to meet someone? All that kind of stuff. Um, but I, 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 I don't care. Ah. I, I, yeah, I know. Well, you'll see. It's a very I, pleasant I love experience, it. though. So I'll give it that. It's a very pleasant experience, and I like being there, and I think it's well acted and everything. I just didn't connect. You're right. Uh, I connected. I think it offers... I mean, we saw X this morning, <laughs> or this afternoon, you know, and I was thinking about, like, so many of these movies of how little they, they give you, right? So if film is meant to be, like, the great art of the last century... Uh, then you wonder how how often you come out feeling a bit empty. And it's not because you expect every film uh, to be a masterpiece. But, you know, you do expect at least a kind of a seriousness of intent, yeah? Mm. You know, a film that wants to tell some kind of story. Or even, you know, if it's going to be a comedy or, you know, a romance or something, you know, that it be a romance, yeah, that kind of... Uh, uh, expresses, you know, the complexities and yearnings and joys and sadnesses of what being in love is like. And you, you, you realize how few films even attempt that. Mm. I think this film does, right? And I think that for me, it succeeds, right? I mean, I recognized, you know, quite a lot of it. Yeah, like kind of, you know, so even she thinks she's the worst person in the world. Mm. You know, why? You know, because she doesn't know what to do with her life. Uh, she falls in love and out of love. She hurts people's feelings. She follows her own desires. Mm. You know, she has got a bad relationship with her father. Her mother clearly loves her, but also equally clearly, yeah, is on tenterhooks with her. I think uh, I, I recognized all of it. I even recognize, you know, mm. so she falls in love with somebody much older. Yeah, to him, she's the love of his life. To her, it's clearly not the case. Mm. Yeah, she's kind of drawn sexually yeah to this other guy in a way that i actually i thought the staging of that was just gorgeous yeah so the the flirting extended flirting sequence when she crashes the wedding right the very idea of crashing the wedding Mm. you know i thought that was lovely right because you rarely see women do that yeah so i think it's very significant that this is a woman doing that Mm. right and that was like part of the joy and the pleasure of watching you know, the film, it's all these things that in many ways are very specific to women. 
you know, uh, or they take on a different resonance when it's a woman that does it. So the crashing mm-hmm. of the wedding is one of it, right? And then, you know, that whole kind of flirting is the wrong word for it because what the film shows you is the way that they are drawn to each other, mm-hmm. yeah, which is something other than flirting. There is clearly flirting, you know, but there is also like the sexual pull, mm-hmm. yeah, between them and this, understa- and this understanding, right? Which is why when they meet again, in the bookshop by accident, he goes back yeah? mm. and she's glad that he comes back. Right. Mm. And then that scene where she leaves her boyfriend's apartment as he's doing coffee and time s- stands suspended. Yeah. She, she, she stops time and she flicks a light switch and t- and everyone stops. It's something we've seen. It's, it's a thing you've seen in like cartoons and other things before. But it just time just stops. Everyone stops. She runs through these streets of statues, people on their way to work and stuff, just completely still, and meets him. Yes, and he's and I like the way that I see it is an expression of what sexual desire is like. It's such a compulsion to get to him. (laughs) Mm. Yes, you know, but it's clearly a sexual yeah desire. The time stands still. It's almost like this desire takes over. Right. Until, yeah, it's kind of fulfilled, yeah, or released or, yeah. And uh, uh, and that's what happens in the film. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was like kind of, you know, incredibly imaginative and to me kind of resonated. Yeah, like kind Mm -hmm. of, you know, I mean, I remember being younger, you know, and you've just got this thing about sex on your brain and like it's almost like you know know, there have been times where I found myself in Brussels right (laughs) yeah and so the sense of other aspects of your life kind of yeah seeming static while you move through you know Mm. in the pursuit of this desire is uh is something that I thought the film did beautifully and it resonated with me yeah yeah it really worked um it didn't resonate with me though I don't think I've ever liked anyone that much not enough for time to stand still. <laughs> Give me five. Well, uh, horses for courses. You know. Yeah. yeah. It was one of the, like in the moment I, I liked it. I think um the star That's um fantastic. Renate Reinsfer, again yes. uh, that's name I'm sure I'm butchering. She's incredible and she won uh at Cannes yes. Best Actress. The, that's where the film premieres. It's been um taken up by movie for UK. An island distribution. Oh, wonderful. So people will get a chance to see it. I thought she was amazing because A, you know, she's incredibly beautiful. And then I think she's got a radiance, like the camera loves her. Yeah, like a little bit like in- Ingrid Bergman or somebody like that, right? Like, you know, mm. there is a radiance to her being uh, that the camera cap- captures somehow or that, you know, it's evoked uh, on film. And then she's also very good about mm. like registering all these little kind of shifts. Yeah. Well, the, the, the kind of emotional register of the film reminded me, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, because I think, I think it has something very North European about it, of a pigeon sat on a branch reflecting on existence. Uh-huh. That Swedish film, you saw. Yes. You know, which is, again, it, it's a comedy. It's much more fantastical. You know, it doesn't, doesn't play in the same the kind of thing. The sense of humour is different, though. The sense of humour is slightly different, but... Um, it has it has a similar kind of kind of downplayed emotional tone to everything. So here, actually, I felt like I wanted a little bit more. I thought, you know, when there are, there are points where um, some very emotionally rich uh, kind of events are happening. Characters like one character gets cancer, and this is the character that you know she, whether she knows it or not, can can articulate to herself or not, loves. Mm. Um, and he's on sat on the edge of his bed telling her how important she is to him, knowing that he's not long for this world, he's got terminal cancer, you know, and I, his eyes are red, he's tearing up, it, he's been incredibly open, and yet I still feel like I wanted, I, it still felt like it was somehow subduing the emotion of the moment. I didn't feel that way, I thought it was beautiful, and I thought it was beautiful because he knows that she doesn't feel the same way. Yeah. For her, for him, she's the love of his life. For her, he's not. That's the way life is. It's Mm. a sadness. You know, kind of all love isn't reciprocated or even when it is reciprocated, it isn't reciprocated with the same intensity. 
But actually, there is a great love on her part. She's there. Mm. Yeah, they speak openly. She's honest with him. Yeah, he obviously has meant a lot to her. And she says, you're the only person I can speak with, kind of, you know, honestly. They share a bed together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she doesn't give him what he wants at that moment because, you know, she doesn't feel the same way. But there is an intimacy there. Mm. Yeah, you know, there is a love there. And I, so I think all of those gradations, all of that complexity is really, like, beautifully evoked. Yeah, you know? mm. It's kind of, you know, the sense of people who do love each other, but they don't love each other in the same way. They don't have the same importance in each other's life. Nonetheless, there is an intimacy. There is kind of, like, a sharing. There is kind of, like... Uh, also a sadness, she's having a baby now, but somebody else's baby was what he's always wanted is a baby, you know, and they didn't have one because she didn't want one, and now she's carrying somebody else's. Like, you know, all of those things add up, and actually I think, you know, that's the beauty of the scene, because it's so dynamic. Yeah, there are so many things going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, it's got so many layers to it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, had there been an explosion or whatever, it would have, like... Uh, 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 sent the orbit in a different direction. Sent the orbit to the yeah, same direction. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying an explosion necessarily, but I, it because it, it worked. I'm, you know, I'm not saying it it didn't work. Um, but I think it's just that this is the film's emotional register, and it's just not quite one that I resonated with. Because I mean, the film actually I was I was, I was thinking about every now and again was Shiva Baby, which was that Jewish uh -huh. kind of comedy of manners. Yes. thing that we saw which um and you you may put it down to being jewish so mm -hmm. that may be part of it but like that that i think for me i think it is comes down to what kind of person you are for me shiva baby was a film where i went oh that's what like being a millennial is like for me i get it you're wanting to tell your parents and all the people that have expectations of you are asking you questions about what you're gonna do tell them just to fuck off no one tells anyone to fuck off here even though you can maybe see it in her eyes that when those you know her boyfriend's adult friends are sort of saying that she's thinking oh God, these questions again you know um but there's much more you know she baby there was much more of a kind of um exasperated open eye-rolling reaction to that kind of thing which is something like you know so it's just i think it's just about the kind of person you are i think all the reviewers who are like getting into this film going this is the best this is the film of the year are just are just connecting with this film in a way that it's missing it. But I, I mean, I also don't think it's about connecting in that way because I think the wonderful thing about film and the wonderful thing about seeing foreign films is that it's not your culture, you know? So I think a Spanish film, you know, would definitely operate on a different emotional register. Yeah, and, you know, it's a, it's a different cultural register and there, there are kind, there's a, a kind of a, an emotional pitch that goes along with that register. So, you know, this is clearly different. However, all of the nuances of it are, to me, clearly understandable. You know, and if you give yourself to it at all, I think anybody will get it, really. And and, and identify. I mean, you know, uh, uh, obviously things are different. You can't imagine somebody who works in a coffee shop and somebody, you know, who works in a bookshop, you know, as an attendant, you know, being able to live in a flat like that in London. Right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. kind of clearly Oslo must be different. Or it's just a movie thing, right? Um, you know, but so many of the things are are recognizable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm saying the same thing. That, I mean, they are. I, I just because the thing is, all those reviewers that you know have been praising it and so on, they're not just Norwegian reviewers. Yes. Not, like there's a universality to what people are seeing in this. Yes. That's a reason it's connecting, just not to me. Right. Oh well, yeah. uh, it connected with me, uh, even though you know I'm much older than, you know, when, when the guy's saying. You know, oh, I'm 44, I'm so old. And of course, he's 44, but he looks 30. He's like super fit. <laughs> and, you think, wow. uh, 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 and you think, I don't know what that makes me. But in, in any case, I, I, I connected with, with it all. I understood it. Mm. Um, yeah, and it made me kind of like sad and wistful because, you know, uh, at the end, like, you know, the, uh, well, what I think the film is marvelous at is that you like, or I liked everybody. Mm. Yeah, I liked the first boyfriend, I liked the second boyfriend. Mm. Yeah, kind of, you know, I liked the family, you know. Uh, so, and yet you understand why the relationships don't work. So, you know, the second boyfriend was like so sweet and nice and, you know, and she liked him and he was clearly crazy about her and, yeah, and kind of, and yet, you know, it didn't work out, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 
actually why that one didn't work out is maybe not as clear to me as it could have just the fact that you know she didn't want the baby i guess um when there was that thing about how he's going to be happy working in a coffee shop till he's 50 yes. and she wants a bit more and yes. she's maybe not sure what she wants she wants more than that yeah i guess so yeah. uh you know then you see him at the end with a baby with you know uh uh a film actress s- yeah kind of yeah maybe a star right because she's got the leading role in this mm-hmm. film right uh so but then she's a photographer kind of you know working in the arts yeah i i really liked it i really liked it a lot um i guess the being pregnant thing brings it into focus for her because does she say that to him about you know you're you're satisfied with this waste of a life does she say that to him after she no before no. she tells him she's pregnant no before she knows before yeah does she know? Does she send it to him after she knows? Because is that the pregnancy bringing it into focus? Do I want, no, 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 do I not... want to have a baby with this man? No, it's not the pregnancy. Uh, though it could be. That's the thing. You don't know, right? You know, it, it could be... Well, I'm, I'm only talking chronologically, like with the, the order of the scenes. Because we see her see the pregnancy test. I just I, can't remember the order it goes. I think in. that come, the pregnancy test comes after that scene. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of... Clearly, th- you know, he doesn't understand why things are not working out. Mm. She also can't express it to him. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, kind of she finds out she's pregnant. And in some ways that makes everything easier. Um, I love the and I think it's an incredible compliment to Joaquin Trier, how he visualizes the, um, uh, the mushroom scene. Mm. You know, kind of the way that the floor dissolves and then, you know, her taking her tampon and throwing it at her father. Again, I've, I don't think I've ever seen anything <laughs> like that in, in, in the history of cinema. Yeah. Right. And, and then, then her then, menstrual blood becomes war paint on her face. That's right. You know, I thought well, that was, those were fantastic things. Mm. Uh, uh, and but it's a great payoff when she wakes up in the morning sober and she, and she has got period blood on her face. So yes. like, you don't see where the tampon went. You yeah. don't see a stain on the wall. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it was cleared up. But she's got the blood in her face, and that's it's a lovely payoff. It's like it's not completely made up. She did this to herself that yes, night. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I, I very much liked all of that. I really liked the structure, you know, with uh, the... Twelve pro- chapters, a prologue and an epilogue. Yeah. Which all reminded me of um, the uh, Pigeon film as well, because that was in... I mean, that's not chron- it's not a straight... Th- it's true, it's different things, but that's in chapters and in yes. se- segments. Again, has, has, has a feel of... of Maybe there's something stage play about it or something. Not stage play, but kind of there's like an artificiality to the to the setup. We know from the start it's it's announced we're going to see twelve chapters plus mm. the beginning and ending. I th- I loved it as a narrational device, and I also loved it as a means of connecting with an audience, mm-hmm. right? Because you know where you are in the film, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, so when you get to chapter six, you think, okay, well, I'm halfway there, and then you're you're paying attention to each chapter as almost like an individual scene mm, yeah mm. kind of trying to think what is being worked out uh in each of those elements um it's narrated i, I sometimes wasn't clear who was doing the narration because there is a voiceover narration at moments right mm-hmm. uh and um i mean i assumed it was her but i wasn't clear that it was her I'm, i wasn't sure that it was the same voice i kind of took it as just a, a voice of god type narration all ah, right but I, but I don't know. I, yeah, um, I don't know that. And it's not consistent, right? It's not like everything is narrated. Every now and again, it comes back in. Yeah. You know, just when it feels right, I guess. Yes. Or maybe, actually, to me, it sometimes felt like when they didn't want to write out a full scene of an argument because as two characters were arguing, for instance, the narration will come in and say, and she argued this and he argued that, as you kind of hear them saying the same thing underneath. Mm. So there's, there's, a com- there's a comic aspect to it, but also... There's a sense in which it takes the strain off the writing of the actual scene, I thought. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I liked it very much. Uh, and I liked the way that the emotional uh, state uh, of each of the character, the protagonist, and the journey that you know she was going through also connects to the larger sociopolitical debates in the culture. Right, so it's almost like each episode allows for an exploration of something. So, you know, the ex-girlfriend of her new boyfriend, you know, getting involved in indigenous and environmental rights and the Tammy people and finding out she's a descendant. Yeah, mm. you get a sense of, 
you know, what the, what that might mean in a Norwegian context. Then I also really liked the interview with the feminists of the cartoonist uh, boyfriend, right? Where, you know, it was, you know, entirely like a Me Too moment. You could understand how the guy was completely clueless about, you know, why this was happening and why it unfolded like so quickly and in that direction. And you could completely see the woman's point of view and his point of view. Yeah. Mm. At the same time, I thought the film handled that like kind of really beautiful, you know, so it, it gets you to, to, yeah, to, to see the various uh, mm. perspectives on that same issue. I think the film is in those scenes, I think it's kind of taking the piss out of everyone involved as well. Um, it's sort of, it's, I think it's kind of setting up a scene and stepping back and saying, this is what these, these kind of debates are like. In a way that I think also with the, with the, um, the g- girlfriend character who does the DNA test and finds out that she's 3.1% Tami, and uh, which, you know, as you said, the um, uh, native indigenous population and then takes on dream catchers and all that kind of shit. It's like it's, it's taking the piss out of that kind of person. Yeah, it's making fun yeah. of it, but I think it's also doing something more complex. So for example, when the interview with the feminist happens, you know, you see the ex-girlfriend witnessing this at the gym, right? And then it cuts to the scene as it's kind of being lived through at the radio station, mm-hmm. right? You know, but it's always now through the eyes of the ex-girlfriend who understands him, understands where he's coming from, but also felt the same thing that these feminists did when she first encountered the comics, Yeah, that mm-hmm. you get her narration at the beginning. So actually... The whole scene being framed through her experience and through her gaze gives it yet another layer, yet another resonance that I thought was kind of really interesting. Mm. Mm. And then there's the animation. We you also know, kind of, aside from everything else, then the film also has that wonderful animated bit. Yeah, during the drug trip. Yes. Yeah, which, um, which is wild and quite aggressive and quite brief, but, you know, a, a real injection of life yes you know it's funny actually you were saying about the narration how it sets up expectations for the audience that we know we're going to see this and i did kind of think you know if you took away that and and you just had it play through wouldn't it feel aimless really and i think that's partly a reflection of this is the kind of person the film is about it's someone who doesn't really have much of a direction has has kind of an impetus and does want certain things but can't articulate and so on and so forth and doesn't necessarily know what she wants um, but again, is that kind of the film taking the strain off itself to keep itself involving that you, that you know, you're in chapter eight, so we've not got so long to go as opposed to, you know, keeping itself involving throughout. Well, I mean, you know, I don't see why it has to be one way. And I, I actually, I'm not sure I like your phrase taking the strain off, you know, I mean, this is a different way of telling a particular story. I think it works incredibly well. And it allows for many complex things to happen, you know, that maybe had it not been broken up in those 12 chapters, you know, it kind of would have been very difficult or felt very clumsy to do so. Um, You know, so, I mean, I I think we have to deal with what is there, yeah, which is this 12 uh, chapter structure, which I think makes for a great film, you know, so. Mm. Well, I disagree then. I am taking what's there and I'm saying, well, I don't know, it wasn't for me. Right. Okay. Well, it was very much for me, uh, and also I think I mean you know I've only seen it once, uh, you know. But on my first viewing, I think aside from whatever I feel about it, I also think it's a great film. Yeah, I think you know there's a, an incredible amount of skill and poetry, yeah, in the telling of something that to me feels really true, yeah, uh, and certainly uh, complex. Mm. I, it just didn't feel rich enough for me. That's all. Like in the moment, I was going with it. I was going, yeah, I, I get, I kind of get this. I like this, but it's. I don't think it's going to linger. You know. Um, uh, I'm not sure. We'll see. I think it will. Um. Yes, I. I mean, I got. Uh, I. You know, I. I got. I was emotionally affected by it. Really, I was emotionally affected by the scenes in the hospital with the first boyfriend mm. and then also the breakup with the second boyfriend. I do think that, you know, there's an interesting perspective uh, that comes from having a female protagonist in this, that there are things that you don't see uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, I like 
you know, the opening image, which is her with a drink being looked at, and then, you know, kind of the closing images, which are her with a camera, yeah, kind of, you know, doing the looking and doing the photographing, and photographing tears, yeah, and then that wistful scene, because I think it is wistful, with, you know, this lovely man who is her ex now, yeah, who she sees through a window with the baby, yeah, and with the, with the, with, with the partner, with the new partner. I think there's a kind of a wonderful wistfulness about it all. Well, when she's editing that, those photos that she's taken of, as it turns out, um, the guy's new partner, um, she's happy with herself. You know, yes, she's landed she on her feet, she's in this kind of little bed sit, but it's very nice, much nicer than, as you say, a London one would be, um, for someone earning that kind of money. And she smiles, you know, she's right with herself. Actually, the film is very clever, because you see what I expected at that scene, right? So she's got some Photoshop program open, mm -hmm. and it clearly has a series of photographs. And you begin with the photos that she took first, which are those of the actress, yeah, in the moment, yeah, crying as she had been crying in the scene that was just filmed previously. And I thought at one point you get an image of her with the ex-boyfriend and the baby. Right. Yeah. And actually that didn't happen. So she's not thinking about the ex-boyfriend. She is just thinking about her work and enjoying that. Mm. And I thought that was like a kind of a clever way you know, to end that, really. It, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, she is kind of... Uh, fulfilled in herself in a way that we haven't seen her be in the film to that point. Mm, yeah, true. Anyway, I highly recommend it. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> you're welcome to. <laughs> uh, Mike clearly feels uh, less passionate about it. Mm. Uh, and on that note, uh, it is coming to Mubi, as you said, yeah? Well, it's been distributed by Mubi in cinema, so we've mm. seen it at the cinema. I don't know if... I mean, I'm sure it has to then come to Mubi on their streaming service, but I don't know when. Well, uh, check time out for all your listings. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that note, uh, thank you very much for listening. We are eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on... Apple Podcasts, Audible, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube on social media. We are on Facebook and Twitter, and the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.